We are going to now look at our chapter 12 notes on sexual reproduction and genetics. And we're going to be talking about meiosis in here. We had a lot, a lot of conversation about egg and sperm and how each of them are what we call haploid cells. So remember in mitosis, at the end of mitosis, each cell produced has the exact same number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So at the end of mitosis, you end up with two daughter cells that are exactly like the parent cell that you started with. Unlike in meiosis, where we are making um, the sperm and the eggs or the sex cells, in which we get four daughter cells, half the number of chromosomes, and they're genetically different than the parent cell. So homologous chromosomes, let's first talk about what a somatic cell is. That is your typical body cell. In human beings, those have 46 chromosomes, 23 um, that come in 23 matched pairs. When we're talking about homo 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 homologous chromosomes, we are talking about um, matched pairs of chromosomes, and they have genes that control the same inherent trait on each one. So on those chromosomes, I might have the trait for hair color on each one of those chromosomes. Remember, the prefix for homo means the same. The locus, or the loci, on the chromosomes, the locus is a single spot, loci are more than one spot, but the locus is the location of on a gene of a chromosome, so it's a, a certain spot on it. So when we're talking about homologous chromosomes, they have genes for the same trait, like we talked about just a minute ago, at the same locus or location, but they might have different versions of them. Might have a dominant trait for hair color on one chromosome, and on the other color, chromosome it might be hair color also, but it has it may have a recessive trait. So you have the same genes for the same trait that you're talking about on each one of the chromosomes, but it may, uh, they may have different versions of what that um, trait is. So what are some types of chromosomes? We have two different types of chromosomes. First are what we call our autosomes, and these are found in both males and females and in human beings. Those are our 20, there's 22 pairs of those. Also in human beings, to make up the 23 total pair, we have those 22 plus we have one more pair of sex chromosomes. And these sex chromosomes determine our gender. Only small parts are homologous, but they behave like homologous pairs during meiosis, so that's important to know. So you can either get an X from one parent and an X from another and be get girl, so XX is a girl, or you can get your X from your mom and then get a Y from your dad, and that would be make it a boy. So those are the types of chromosomes. We inherit one chromosome from each pair from our mother and one from our father. So you get one of those traits, say for hair color from your mother and one of those from your father, even though they might be different versions. So let's talk about gametes. Gametes are sex cells and they we have to first figure out what a diploid cell is so that we can then figure out that's what we start with when we start to make gametes. Diploid cells are cells who um, uh, nucleus contains two sets of homologous chromosomes. So those are our body cells that we talked about. Those are those somatic cells. Um, they have twice the number, di means two, twice the number of the chromosomes that are in the haploid cells. So we represent these as 2n, n being the um, number of cells that you find in a haploid cell. So 46 chromosomes in humans. We have 44 of those are autosomes or diploid cells, and two are sex chromosomes. Next, we have what we call haploid cells. These are also known as gametes or sex cells. They only have one of each of the homologous pairs, so you only have a single set of these chromosomes. These are gametes, or they're sperm or eggs. And they have a haploid number. This is the total number of chromosomes in a haploid cell. They're depicted as the letter N. They're half the number of the diploid cell. So remember, in humans, we have 23 in humans, 22 are autosomes, and one are sex cells or haploid cells. So we have 20, 
three pairs of diploid cells and we have one pair of sex chromosomes or gametes or haploid cells as they're called. So when fertilization occurs, we have the egg and the sperm, both of which are haploid cells, so they are depicted with the letter N, and they come together and they fertilize. Um, when they fertilize, they result in a zygote, which is depicted as 2N, because it's the bringing this two, the N from the egg and the N from the sperm together. So gametes are the result of a division of process called meiosis. Meiosis is what separates your genotypes into separate genotypes. The letters separates the letters in a genotype into the separate genotypes into the different sex cells. So that way they can be brought together during fertilization. So meiosis is what I like to, that we call a reduction division. That means the number of chromosomes is de, de reduced throughout this process. So my end product are four daughter cells that only have half as many chromosomes in them and they ha are genetically different than what we started off with. So it occurs in our reproductive organs, ovaries and testes, and it involves two divisions. So we have uh, all of these um, uh, steps in meiosis one and meiosis two to complete this process. So meiosis 1, more homologous chromosomes will actually separate. So during interphase, just like in mitosis, at the very end, our chromosomes duplicate. And then we go right into prophase 1. Now, also in meiosis and prophase 1, just like in mitosis, our spindle fibers form. But two very, very other important things occur. Number one, um, we have a process of synapsis where our homologous chromosomes, each of them have two sister chromatins, they come together as a pair to form a tetrad together where there's the four pieces. So the two sister chromatins come together to form a tetrad where we have the four of them. The legs of those homologous chromosomes often flop over each other and they can exchange information. This is where we get our source of genetic variation and we call that crossing over and that occurs in prophase one. After prophase one, we go right into metaphase and metaphase one, it, like we do in mitosis. The difference here is that the tetrads line up together in um, the middle in metaphase one. The sister chromatins don't line up separately. The tetrads that were formed in prophase one line up. Then what happens in anaphase is they get pulled away. One homologous chromosome from each tetrad pulls apart. So only the tetrads separate, not the sister chromatins. So we have sister chromatins that are moving towards the outer edge in anaphase 1. Then after anaphase, we have telophase. So in telophase 1, each pole has a haploid number of chromosomes, one for each homologous pair, and then cytokinesis occurs. Does interphase um, occur again? In some species, the interphase does occur again. But no matter what, we have no chromosomal duplication in this process. All right? The chromosomes uncoil, the nuclear members, membranes can reform, but we have no chromosomal duplication if interface occurs in that species. So in part two of meiosis, we again have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, all of them as two. But in prophase, the only thing that occurs is that we have our spindle fibers, fibers form. Please note that in metaphase 2, the chromosomes line up on in the middle of the plate, just like before. And these are the sister chromatin that will line up in the middle. In anaphase, those sister chromatin pull apart in anaphase 2. And in telophase 2, you have new nuclear membranes form, and then your cytokinesis occurs. What's important is, remember, I keep saying that we want to remember what the result, end result of mitosis is. And we also need to know what the end result of meiosis is. In meiosis, our end result in males, we get four viable sperm. In females, we only get one viable egg. But we do account for the other two, three, and those are what we call three polar bodies. So let's take a look at that. Here we go. Here's our meiosis. Take a look at, we have our um, DNA replication in 
the, um, the division one. And this is also where we get our uh, recombination and where we get our crossing over and our genetic um, variation occurs. And then we get our cell division into two cells. And then we go into our mitotic two process. Again, no new cell replication. We're just dividing them apart. So our end result are four cells with half the number of chromosomes from our initial cell. And they're genetically different than our initial cells chromosomes. So here's what happens in oogenesis. And this is where we get the development of our one egg. And then we end up with three polar bodies. And these polar bodies, the, the genes aren't quite the same in them as they are in the egg. And it's almost a way of having um, other chromosomes that may not necessarily be in a normal egg go into these bodies. It's kind of a, a, like a dumping ground for the ones that aren't quite right. This picture here is a great um, electronic microscope picture of sperm on an ovum. Now, let's talk about Mendel's Law of Heredity. In eighth grade, you should have talked about Mendel's Law and talked in great detail about his um, actual process of the peas that he used and what he did with them and, and the first generation and the second generation and that type of thing. So today we're going to talk about what were the results, what did Mendel get from those experiments, what were some of the, the, big, the big pieces that we came away with. Before we can understand that, we have to understand the difference between heredity and genetics. Genetics is actually the study of heredity, and heredity is when we are talking about the passing on of characteristics from parents to offspring. The characteristics that are passed on or that are inherited by the offspring, passed on to the offspring, inherited by them, are called traits. You need to know all three of those for the test. So Gregor Mendel was a monk who lived in the 1800s, and he carried out many, many experiments on his garden peas. He was a gardener in um, his monk. And there was a few reasons that he chose peas. One of the number one reasons is, there's three reasons actually, um, is that because peas reproduce sexually. Sometimes kids forget that plants do actually reproduce sexually. So they form gametes. We have sperms and eggs. And fertilization unites these gametes to form a zygote, which develops into a seed. So the male portion of the um, plant is the pollen piece. And then we have an ovum inside the plant. And so the male and female part come together for fertilization and it creates these seeds. Secondly, peas normally can self-pollinate, which means that pollen can fall down into the ovum and it can pollinate itself or they can um, uh, fertilize. So Mendel could take the male um, pollen from one pea plant and shake it over another pea plant, and he could cross-pollinate them. And so he could be sure of who the parents were given in the cross and kind of control things that way. And then lastly, peas are easy to grow and reproduce quickly so that we can see generational changes fairly quickly. We're not waiting years to see what these changes could be. So those were the three reasons why he chose the peas. When you think about the peas that you see that you eat off your plate at home, and you look at them, usually the seed shape is round, but they can be wrinkled. Usually the color is green, though they can be yellow. If you look at a pea plant, usually the flower color is purple, but it can be white. And if you look at the height, they're usually tall, but they can be short. So there's certain characteristics that go around along with the, the plant traits. So, you know, the round would end up being the dominant trait because those are the ones that you see the most of, etc. Now, the offspring of parents that have different forms of traits is what we call a hybrid. And you're going to need to know what a hybrid is for your test. And so what Mendel did was he crossed parents with different traits, like tall, short, and recorded data on what the resulting hybrid of the offspring would be like. What he came up with was a couple of uh, three rules. The first rule is the rule of unit factors. When that Mendel uses the word factors, you have to keep in mind that in nowadays terminology, those would be genes. But he didn't know what genes were back then. He just knew that there was something that each parent contributed that was um, giving, giving rise to the traits. 
And so he called them factors. And what he said was that each organi organism has two of these factors that control each of its traits. And they have, these are called alleles. And they have alternate forms of a gene. They can either be dominant or can re they can be recessive. Dominant traits are represent always represented by capital letters, while recessives are represented by lowercase letters. His second rule is the rule of dominant. So it says that between those forms of alternate traits, the dominant trait will always show up when paired with the recessive form. So it always covers up the recessive form. The third thing is the law of segregation. And this says that we have two alleles for each gene, and when gametes are produced, each one of the, the gametes receives only one of these alleles. So that way when they go back together, you're going to get one from mom and one from dad. So here's some more vocabulary. And you really need to know this vocabulary so that we can um, work on Punnett squares this um, unit. First is phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is the physical outward appearance that the organism has for whatever trait it might be. Genotype is the allele combinations that um, gives that organism those traits. So that's the letter combinations. Now, homozygous, remember the prefix homo means the same. Zygote is what results when we have two gametes come together with the 2N number of, um, of um, chromosomes. And um, so it means that you have two alleles that are identical. So they can either be two capital letters, two lowercase letters, but they have to be the same. So that means that our heterozygous are two alleles that are different from one another. But they still have to be the same letter. So it would be capital letter, lowercase letter. It's really important that you understand the difference between genotype and phenotype and be able to recognize if they told you to write down the um, uh, dominant um, homozygous traits for the male, for the father, that you're able to be able to write that down for your Punnett squares and heterozygous. So you really need to understand these four terms. So let's take a look here. If we have a pea plant that has purple flowers, purple capital F is dominant over the white flower lowercase f. That would mean the plant's genotype would be homozygous. So they have to be the same letter, capital F, capital F. It can't be lowercase, lowercase F, because that would make it recessive. And we said that it's purple, so it has to be dominant. Or it can be heterozygous, which means I'm going to have the one capital and the one lowercase, because hetero means different. It still makes the phenotype to be purple, because we said the rule of dominance says that the dominant trait is always going to mask the recessive trait. So what if we have a pea plant with white flowers? The plant's genotype can only be one thing. That would be lowercase f, lowercase f, because it is homozygous. You can only get a recessive trait if they both are the lowercase. So that means this plant's phenotype or physical characteristics is going to be that of a white flower. So we need to know a lot of this so that we can start doing Punnett squares. And what are Punnett, Punnett squares? This is a technique that we use to predict the results of crosses between different parents. So if I know the genotypes, the parents, I can put these in these Punnett squares so that I can predict what the outcomes are going to be. And we're going to talk some about monohybrid crosses, where we cross between parents that have different one trait. So we're just having um, one trait that we're worried about, hair color, eye color, etc. What it does is it determines the probability of a certain, not only genotype that will occur in a certain offspring, but also phenotype that will occur. And we can determine the percent that we could expect to happen from those Punnett squares. So it's a predictor that geneticists can use. So those are all of our notes on um, chapter 10. So hopefully this was helpful for you. And um, we will then be um, going on to working on some Punnett squares next.